so I, I like to start with a pop quiz, um, which is to guess what year this is from. So just call them out if you're, if you're uh, bold. What year do you think this org chart is from? 35? 85? 2019? 2010? This is like, yeah, this is like a game show, whoever gets closest. Um, okay, so yeah, th those are fine guesses. Uh, it's actually from 1910. This is one of the very first boxes and lines org charts. It's from a very old railroad, the uh, Southern Pacific Railroad in the United States. And um, what is fascinating to me about this quiz is that when I give it anywhere in the world, and I've given it as far away as Manila, um, I get answers ranging from 1800 to yesterday, which tells us something. Either uh, it's incredibly perfect, the, the way we organize is spot on and we can all go home, or there's something intractable about it, right? There's something that we have had trouble changing. And what's interesting is if I'd shown you a picture of almost anything else, a dress, a house, a shoe, a phone, right, from 100 years ago, you would have been able to carbon date it right on site. That's old, that's Victorian, that's new, et cetera. But I show you this tool by which we visualize all of human effort, and we can't even guess within a century what year it's from. Interesting data point. Second quiz, uh, these are some ways of working. These are some ways of showing up with each other at work. And so we have uh, insisting on doing everything through channels, never permitting shortcuts in order to expedite decisions, referring matters to committees for further study, right, and making sure those committees are as large as they possibly can be, uh, haggling over the precise wordings of communications to employees and to customers and every sort of email and, and policy we create, referring back to matters that were decided upon at the last meeting, right? In back-to-back, -back, you know, coffee, by the water cooler, over email, trying to relitigate what we've already decided. And then my personal favorite, as someone that works with large companies, uh, multiplying the procedures and clearances involved in things like getting people paid and getting people onboarded and hired and so on. See that three people have to approve everything where one would do. Show of hands, who's ever seen behavior like this in the workplace? So we're all at about 100%. Does anyone know what it's from? So these instructions, most people guess, are from my own ethnography, right? I've been inside all these big companies. What have I seen? I've written it down. I wish that were the case. That is not the case. These are actually from the CIA's guide to how to sabotage a company <laughs> that were created during World War II. World War II, we sat down and those of us that were allies were like, how do we undermine the economy of, companies, or of uh, countries that are against us? And the answer was, we can practice teaching them to work in this way. So when we had people that were aligned with us inside companies uh, in, you know, across Europe, they did these things in order to basically slow down to a crawl the companies that they worked in and ultimately put them out of business. So what is fascinating about that, and by the way, there are many more. There's about 14 or 15 uh, you know, principles in there. But what is fascinating about it is it means that in the space of about 80 years, this has gone from obviously wrong to a world where work is indistinguishable from sabotage, where effectively we're all sabotaging each other all the time. And, you know, and we wonder why the economy isn't working for everyone. Okay, so how did we get here? So I like to ask the question of why and sort of dig back in, into the history books. And basically the story that we, that we hear is the story of an older economy, the artisanal, the merchant economy, when things were made by hand. So here we have a shoemaker or a cord wainer. Uh, and back then, you know, you were, it was masters and apprentices, right? The shoemaker did everything. You were customer service, you were design, you were supply chain, you were the person that cleaned up the shop at night, you were security, you were all, you know, everything. And the apprentice was learning from you and your mastery. And then when they, you know, kind of grew up, they took over. And that was great, and it was fine for the, you know, customer there in the chair. But you could only make about one pair of shoes a day by hand in this way. And so when we had something like, say, the Napoleonic Wars pop up and we needed 40,000 pairs of boots in a day, um, there was no way to do that. And you can't take master craftsmen and put them in a factory and get more boots. You just get 500 people in a factory making 500 boots a day. It doesn't solve the scale problem. And so along came a bunch of thinkers. There were some uh, in Europe, like Henri Fayol. There were people in the United States, like Taylor, who uh, basically said, you know, I have a solution. I have a way to get this done, and it looks like this. 
And the solution was, more, you know, on the long and short of it, um, we need to separate the thinking from the doing. So this is called scientific management. So there are certain people that will do the thinking, we'll call them managers, and there are certain people that will do the doing, and we'll call them workers, and our job is to figure out the one best way to do everything. Because back then, because it was a craft economy, the machinists and the people that did these different jobs, everybody did them in their own way. No one really knew what was possible in terms of efficiency or productivity, and so there was a little bit of a, of a loss about how do we get better without knowing what's right. So Taylor and his friends came along, and this is a guy who ran around with a stopwatch all the time, who was like, there is an exact amount of weight that should be in a shovel full of coal, and that amount is 23.8 pounds. And if you do 23.9, you're not shoveling efficiently, according to Taylor. So he introduced this idea, the separation of the thinking from the doing, the managers were the stopwatch holders, everyone else was meant to comply, and of course, to get everyone to uh, give up their way of working and to give up their autonomy, he paid more. So he'd actually say, hey, do it my way, and I'll pay you 15% more or 20% more. And if you don't like it, you can go back to doing it your way, but if you're okay with it, you can keep getting paid the surplus. And so slowly but surely, they aligned the workforce towards this way of working. Now, the good news was that things like this and the, you know, the assembly line and you know, all those inventions of, that Ford and others had were really, really effective. So we got this huge burst in productivity. We got a lot more uh, convenience, consistency, quality. The ultimate quality of life of most people in developed economies went up, and it's actually gone up quite a bit, you know, 6x since then. So there's been this enormous lift in terms of what we're capable of. And if you buy, you know, a, a box of muesli right now, the fact that it's the same as the one you'd get at the other store and that it doesn't kill you is mostly, you know, thanks to, to Taylor and, and his contemporaries. Now, the problem is that as the world has evolved and become more global, more interconnected, more technologically driven, and frankly, as our expectations have gone up of what we expect of each other and of work, uh, these things have stopped working quite as well and nobody really noticed. So these are a couple statistics that I like to track. One is uh, the average lifespan of companies, so corporate mortality. How long, on average, does a company stay alive? And if you look at the S&P 500, which is an index of some of the biggest and you know, most important companies uh, on my side of the pond, they um, used to be, if you were on that list, you'd be on it for 60 years, 60 plus years, a huge dynasty of success. But now it's actually closer to about 10 years, 12 years on average. So essentially, it's become much, much harder to stay big and relevant for a long amount of time. So there's a lot of that pressure there. The second thing we look at is return on assets. So ROA is much better than watching maybe, say, the, the price of stocks, because it is how much profit can you generate based on what you own. It's really hard to game. Almost everything else with financial engineering, we can game and make look the way we want it to look, but ROA is pretty straightforward, and it's gone from close to 5% to lower than 1.3%, and it's on its way down even further than that. So essentially, companies have gotten bigger, their stocks have gotten bigger, but they're unable to generate profit as effectively as they were in the past, as, you know, as a whole, industry has, has really struggled there. Um, and so now we're not as efficient, we're not as effective as maybe we thought we were. And then things like productivity growth. Productivity growth is stalling right now. Almost, it's almost as bad as it's been since World War II. Um, we're no longer able to get better and better at producing that next gain in the output per hour of every man and woman in the workforce. And so economists are puzzling. They're like, why is this? What the heck is going on? Why is it that we can't make sense of why we're not able to get better? We have all these tools. We have mobile phones that are more powerful than the computers that took us to the moon, and yet we can't seem to get any more juice out of the orange. And in the midst of that, we're not psyched. So I'm sure that there are people out there who are doing very well and very happy with how work is going, but on the whole, one in two people is not engaged at work. They're working for the weekend. That's if they have a job. 16% uh, of people are actively disengaged, which Gallup would define as sabotaging the people that they work with in a, in a kind of on-purpose way. Um, you know, one in two are unhappy in their job. Almost one in two are thinking about quitting. Right? So this is, to me, this data is a travesty because we're talking about a world where we spend a third to a half of our lives at work and half of us don't want to be there? You know, that's, uh, that's really, really depressing. And so it begs the question of what is really happening. So we, we changed the way we worked 100 years ago. We got some of the gains from it. Slowly those gains have sort of been whittled away. We're a little bit stuck. We're in this set of stasis. 
Uh, we don't have productivity growth. We can't keep businesses alive for longer. People are disenfranchised. And everybody's going, you know, what's wrong? What's happening? And we're pointing the finger at a lot of things. If you look at culture as a whole right now, we love to point the finger and we're pointing it at a lot of things. But to me, there's really only one explanation for what's happening. Bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is what's happening. We've got the red tape wrapped around the handle so hard and so far that we can't get any of the productivity out of the system that we're capable of. We can't achieve our potential. So what do I mean by bureaucracy? There's technical debt, there's financial debt. Everybody understands financial debt. You borrow money, you gotta pay it back with interest. That's something that kinda hangs over your head. Most people understand technical debt now in software. If you develop that software too quickly, you make shortcuts, you make choices that might not work out later. So then you have to go back and refactor it and edit it and, and refine it in order for that code to keep working in your software. But organizational debt is not talked about hardly at all. And organizational debt to me are any structure, policy, practice, norm, behavior that we have that's no longer serving us that we haven't gone back to get rid of, to refine, to change, to update. So a perfect example, a pair of gloves here. There's an organization in France called Favi. It's an auto brass parts manufacturer. And when the CEO took over a couple decades ago, he went into the factory floor and he noticed someone waiting with a pink slip by a cage full of supplies. And he asked the gentleman, what are you doing? Oh, well, I'm waiting for new gloves, sir. Oh, interesting, and what's this slip all about? And the guy's like, well, when, you, when your gloves wear out, you have to go to your boss, you show them the worn out gloves, they approve that they're really worn out, then they give you a permission slip. You take that permission slip, you leave your machine on the factory floor, you walk over to this cage, you give it to the person that manages the cage, you wait, they go back into the storehouse, they get your gloves, they bring them back, and now you have new gloves, you get back to work. And he had the CFO with him, and he said, how much are the gloves? Five euro. Cool. And how much does it cost to shut this man's machine down for a half an hour? 5,000 euro. <laughs> the gloves are going to be free from now on, right? That's organizational debt. How did that happen? Somebody stole a pair of gloves, or a pair of gloves went missing, or a box of gloves went missing. And some leader who was like, my job is to ensure perfection and compliance and efficiency and use the stopwatch, we're not going to lose another pair of gloves. And so they built a cage, and they put them under lock and key, and they created the permission slip process. And they treated everyone like children, or worse, frankly. I treat my kids differently than that. But they treated everyone in a way where they did not trust them. And the cost was that every time someone needed a new pair of gloves, they lost 5,000 euro in productivity. So that's one example. There are hundreds. Every team I talk to can point to the way we do things that's slowing us down, that's creating tension, that's causing friction in the system. They can point to that, and they can also say, I don't know how to change that, right? I don't have the right to change that. I don't have permission. Nobody really knows who owns it. And part of that is because we've created an economy where we change jobs so often. So some leader comes in, they create a policy that's fit for the time they do it at, and let's say, hey, great, God bless. Then two years later, another leader comes in, and then two years later, another, and then two years later, another. And now we ask, why do we do the budget this way? And everybody goes, I don't know. It was like that way when I joined. And so now we've just inherited this, this rat's nest of policy and approach and process that feels like it's responsible, that feels like it's compliant, that feels like its job is to you know, keep good order. But in, in actuality, when we study it, it is, is mostly creating uh, a lot of bloat. And in fact, they've done the research, and in the US alone, there are $3 trillion of waste every year from needless policy and from layers of management that aren't really adding value. Three trillion, it's about eight trillion globally. So we're, we're looking for this productivity, where is it? It's, it's actually stuck in, inside the organizational debt. So why do we do this? Well, we do this for a very simple reason, which is that we confuse the nature of the systems around us. So most people, if they look at these two words, and most leaders that I work with, use these words interchangeably, complicated, complex. If anything is difficult to understand or frustrating or has a lot of parts, we say it's complicated, it's complex. Same difference. But when you talk to systems theorists, as I have, they say, oh, no, no, those words don't mean the same thing. They're two very different kinds of systems. And the problem is when you mistake one for the other, you'll make choices in the way you interact with that system that will frustrate you and make you uh, upset that you're not getting what you want. So I figured we would do a 60-second you know, master's degree in systems theory together, and then when you walk out of here tonight, you'll be on top of it. So, 
Let's start with a little uh, pop quiz on this. A watch, show of hands, who thinks a watch is a complicated system? Sure, okay, who thinks it's a complex system? Okay, and how many conscientious objectors that think I'm trying to trick you? <laughs> okay, um, what about uh, an engine, complicated? Okay, complex? Okay, let's change the slide. Weather, complicated? Oh, one, two, yep, complex? Okay, and traffic, complicated? Uh-huh, complex? Okay, great. You did exactly what every audience in the world does, which is about half the people put their hands up for one, half for the other, and then around, around round two, we get like a third and a third, and a lot of people looking at me you know, with a scowl. Um, we're not sure, and that's totally cool, because guess what? Three years ago, I wasn't sure either. Like, there, there is a real gap here in our understanding that we need to fix. So, let's fix it. Uh, these systems, the watch, the engine, are what a systems theorist would call complicated systems. And that means that they are causal systems. They are linear, they have many parts, and sometimes they're really complicated, but uh, an expert can understand them. They can be predicted, they can be fixed. If you have a problem in a complicated system, it can be solved, right? If you take your broken car into the mechanic and you say, something's not right, on Monday they will give it back to you and it will work. 999 times out of 1,000, right? There's not a lot of uncertainty there. And so this is that causal system. By the way, easy way to remember this, uh, if there are any um, watch fans in the room, what is the inside of a very nice watch called? Complication, yeah, a complication. So these are complicated systems. Now, these are complex systems, weather, traffic, a six-year-old, right? <laughs> They're, complicate, they're complex because uh, we, they are dispositional, meaning they have a direction they're going, they have a vector, but we can't be exactly sure how they're gonna develop and change. We can't change them in exactly the way that we want, right? So they have a disposition, they're dispositional. They can surprise us, right? If, you, if a system is likely to surprise you, where you're like, huh, didn't expect that, it's probably a complex system. Right? It's not predictable, and that's because the agents in it are in such an interesting relationship with each other that they create these patterns that essentially look like randomness or chaos or, or unlikely emergent events. So things can happen we don't expect, right? And whenever you see something like that happen, like let's say Trump or Brexit or fill in the blank, you're dealing with a complex system. Now, complex systems, when you have a problem in a complex system, it cannot be fixed. It can only be managed. Nobody ever comes in from the garden and says, honey, I fixed the garden. That's silly. No one would ever say that. In the same way that no one would ever yell at the weather, right? You can, yelling at it is not going to do anything. So there's a, there's a punchline here. Um, and what it is, is that when we think about organizations, there are a lot of different contexts inside the organization. There are some problems that are complicated, there are some that are complex, there are some that are simple, chaotic, disordered, etc. But the reality is the organization itself, the culture itself, is a complex system. You put 10 or 10,000 or 100,000 people together, you have a system that will surprise you. And so when I hear of leaders that are frustrated because they're doing a culture change process where they've written the values on posters and coffee mugs and hung them all over the office and now they're mad that people aren't behaving differently, I go, you're yelling at the weather, dude. You are yelling at the weather. The right way to interact with a complex system is to nudge it, to poke it, to see what happens when we do this or do that, and feed or starve the system, to play with it. You can only do it through interaction. You can only do it by seeing what happens when something changes. So essentially what we're saying is that to manage this complexity we need a different operating system. And I use this metaphor lightly but I think it's helpful to say that there's a kind of a foundational OS at the heart of every organization, of every team. It's a set of assumptions and principles and practices and behaviors and norms and patterns that define how we do what we do. There are assumptions all over the place at work that we haven't thought about in a long time. Perfect example, walk into a conference room, what will you find there? Table and chairs. Table and chairs is an assumption. What are we gonna do in this room? We're gonna meet. What does that need? Well, we're gonna need chairs because we're gonna be sitting for a long time. Okay, so meetings must be long. We're gonna need a table to put our laptops on so we can be checking our email and doing other work while we're in this meeting. Okay, so meetings must not be very focused. Um, we're not gonna need the space to move around and use our bodies, which actually helps us to think better. Okay, so we're gonna be static. 
And if we're lucky, we might get a whiteboard, but we might not, right? And if we're lucky, we might get a window, but we might not. So the assumptions about what happens in a meeting, what happens in a meeting room, are, are many. And yet, 99 out of 100 of us go to work every day, we go to meetings, we go to meetings in these rooms, and that's just taken as a given. That's just how the world of work works. So I want to show you the power of an operating system through this example, because the reality is, when we bring those assumptions and that thinking to the table, when we solve a problem, we create something new, or when we reinvent something, that matters a lot. The assumptions shape the solution. So for example, take an intersection. This is a problem space. We have two roads crossing. Our goals are for people not to hit each other and to have the maximum flow of traffic. So on the left, we have the signal controlled intersection, the lighted intersection with red, yellow, and green lights and turn arrows and flashing lights and all this. And on the right, we have the roundabout, okay? Now, what are the assumptions of the lighted intersection? About people, about the problem. Yeah, they, we can't trust these people. We gotta tell them what to do. If we, if we trust them, they'll kill each other. So what we'll do is we'll tell them when to go and when to stop and when to slow and when to go left. We're gonna control this. And the way we're gonna control it is not with some person standing in the middle, but we're actually gonna create a big apparatus. So we're gonna have electricity and we're gonna have a control center in the background there that controls how all the lights in the city work and we're gonna have an algorithm and a huge team of people all to control these intersections so we can make sure that everything works. And then on the right, we have the roundabout. What are the assumptions about people and the problem in the roundabout? Yeah, we kind of have to put it on them, right? It's, you know, it's, there, it's on them. They have to be responsible. So we'll have a couple simple rules. We call these enabling constraints, as opposed to governing constraints. And the enabling constraints will be go with the flow of traffic and give the right of way to the people in the circle, right? And that, those two rules are sufficient to cover every possible permutation of behavior that could occur. Almost anything that can occur can be handled by those, uh, you know, rules. And so, we have these two different systems. Now, of course, we then have to ask the question, well, which one is more popular? So, at least in the U.S. where I am from, obviously, uh, this is 1,000 times more popular than that. 1,000 times more popular. But then you ask the question, well, which one's safer? The roundabout, yeah. It's like 80% safer, 95% safer on fatality collisions. Uh, which one has higher throughput? Yeah. Roundabout, 80 to 90% higher throughput. Which one's cheaper to build and maintain? Ten to $15,000 cheaper. Which one works better when the power goes out? <laughs> the roundabout, by a mile, right? And yet, we have a thousand times more of this one. And not only that, but when I ask people in most places around the world that are less familiar, maybe less comfortable with the roundabout, which one do you feel safer in? They say, oh, I feel much safer at the lighted intersection. I much prefer the lighted intersection. Thank you very much. Um, and what they're telling me is, this system does the thinking for me. In this system, I can be on my phone while I wait for the green light. In this system, I have to be present. This asks more of us. It asks more of us, but as a result, we get all those benefits, right? We get this dramatically more performance system. And so as we look at organizations, these are essentially two different operating systems. How will we solve the problem of structure, of budgeting, of compensation, of how we allocate resources, of how we you know, build teams, right? We will solve those either with a lighted solution or with a roundabout solution. So two different operating systems, and of course everything in between, this is a spectrum. So one is about control and compliance, the other is about trust and autonomy. Now, I'm not saying that every possible intersection in the world should be a roundabout, any more than I'm saying that every single thing at work should be you know, a trust and responsibility free-for-all. What I'm saying is we have to think for the first time in a century about what is the appropriate solution for the context. And the reality is that for most of our challenges at work, the roundabout solution, the solution that depends on trust and autonomy and transparency, is far more likely to be successful than it ever has been before, and is far more likely to give us what we need than the alternative approach. So, this is an operating system. These are the spaces where work is changing the most, that are in flux. Things like purpose and strategy and workflow and membership and authority and structure and information and so on. And in each of these spaces, we have choices to make as leaders, as team members, as partners, as collaborators. How will we show up? What do we believe 
about innovation and what do we practice, right? So what do we think is true? What are our principles and what are our practices? What do we believe about information? Should, should everybody have it? Should no one have it? Should it be under lock and key? Should it be push or pull, right? We have choices to make and for the first time we're really asking ourselves what is requisite? What is correct for this context in this moment today? We're taking ownership of our way of working again for the first time. So a few examples of organizations around the world that have started to do this uh, at some point in the last 20 or 30 years, some of them quite a bit under the radar. So here we have Handelsbanken, which is uh, a bank based in Sweden. This is actually in Stockholm. I was standing right there freezing uh, just about a year ago. And this is kind of ground zero for the new ways of working movement. In the 70s, uh, a new CEO took over after um, a failure, really, an economic failure, and the bank was struggling. And he said, you know, I'm really going to flip the table over here and say that the branches are the bank. That's where the customers are. That's where the information is. I don't really think I should be telling them what to do from the center anymore, so I'm going to flip the model, and we're going to give them the authority to, at the edge, optimize for what matters. And they decided that what mattered for the bank was profit over revenue and customer satisfaction. So every branch started measuring profit over revenue and customer satisfaction. They started transparently sharing their scorecard with each other. And they started deciding for themselves who would we lend loans to at what rate, what products would we offer, what service would we grant when customers had problems, all pushed out to the edge. They then decided to start to play with budgeting. Why do an annual budget when the world changes so fast? Instead, we'll just spend money responsibly watching those metrics at a local level and then a regional level and then a system level. And then towards the end, why does corporate set the budget for the branches? Really, the money comes into the branches. Shouldn't it be the other way around? Shouldn't the branches set the budget for corporate? So all kinds of interesting uh, experiments and challenges. And what's fascinating about uh, Handelsbanken is that for the last 40 years, They've beaten the average profit over revenue of European banks as a whole in the aggregate. They have basically breezed through all the major downturns that we've had. Why? Because they don't give ridiculous loans to ridiculous people. They're actually much more community-centric, they're much more tight and connected to customer, and they're empowered to make good decisions at the edge. There's not an incentive system pushing somebody to sign up 15 accounts. There's actually an incentive system that says we all win or lose together. If we beat that average for the market as a whole, we all get uh, money in our pension. If we don't beat that average for the market as a whole, nothing for anybody. We're all in it together. And so there's a learning ecology inside this system. So I highly recommend you look at Handelsbank and they've done some really interesting things. And right now, actually, they've just hired their first female CEO who uh, has you know, a big job ahead of her. So a uh, fun one to watch over time, almost four decades of history there. Here we have Morningstar, which is a tomato processor. It's actually the world's largest tomato processor based in California. And the guy that started this thought, you know, this is already a pretty rough industry. You're dealing with tomatoes all day. So instead of uh, treating people without dignity, I'm going to let everybody write their own job description and set their own salary. Which, you know, when I first tell that, all the MBAs in the room are like, <gasps> But uh, here we have a company with 20 years of track record where everybody does that every year. The average profitability in their category is 2%. Their profitability average over those 20 years is 20%. 10x outperforming the category. And the way it works is really simple. They use something called an advice process. So when I create my job description, if I then share it with my colleagues for advice, they give me their feedback. Here's where I think you've undershot or overshot or you've, you know, last year you were able to deliver on this or, or you weren't. Um, I have to consider that advice. I don't have to take it, but I have to consider it and listen to it. And then I make my choice of how to edit and refine my output. And my output's public, so everyone's going to know what I did and didn't heed. Same thing for salary. I'm going to have transparent information about the company's profitability, the category averages, what's normal for the positions I hold, all those things. And then I'm going to make a recommendation. An elected body of my peers who specialize in comp are going to provide me advice. I can take it or leave it. And so on we go. And of course, if somebody decides that they want to get you know, paid Jeff Bezos money one year, there is a conflict transformation process that is available to everyone so that if they have those issues, they can deal with them. But surprisingly, it doesn't happen very often. Why? Because there's a new form of control in a company like Morningstar. Instead of top-down compliant control, they have social pressure and peer control. They hold each other 
responsible. They hold each other in agreement about what they're trying to build, and there's an alignment that comes from that that is uh, quite powerful. So that's Morning Star. Um, next time you have some catch-up, you can think of them. Uh, the USS Santa Fe, one of my personal favorites, because I'm often heckled by people who are like, we're in a regulated industry, or we're in an industry where if we screw up, people die. And so we can't do any of this stuff, we have to run it um, in an authoritarian way. And here's the story of, of, of a submarine captain named David Marquette who took over, and his commander put him in charge and said, look, this is the lowest performing sub in the Navy. The lowest performing sub in the Navy. I need you to turn it around, I know it's not the sub that you've prepared your whole career for. It's, it's a completely novel piece of equipment to you. It is a nuclear sub. So it runs on nuclear energy. It is armed with nuclear weapons. And you're going to take it over, but there's one twist. I need you to turn it around without changing any of the personnel on the boat. So you've got to keep the personnel. It's the worst. I need you to make it better. And so he got on the boat, and of course people came up to him and said, you know, Captain, what should I do? What are my orders? And he was like, well, I don't really know the boat very well, so what can I say? But he said, well, what do you intend to do? They were like, no one's ever asked me that before. So I'll go think about it. Thought about it, came back. Captain, I intend to you know, go 45 degrees starboard dock, do this training exercise, refuel, and then head out to sea. He'd say, very well. And that went on, right? People came to him for advice. He said, look, I, you know, what do you intend to do? He helped them think through it a little bit, but he didn't issue orders. He saved one decision for himself, and that was the decision to fire. He said, if we're going to fire, I'm going to take that responsibility on myself. I'll carry that. Everything else is up to the team. And through a combination of that empowerment, transparency, uh, models around what competency and good looks like that everybody really got aligned on, it went from the worst performing to the best performing ship in the system and produced more officers than any other ship to that point, right, in the space of about two years. So it is possible, even in a high stakes environment, to really rethink the way we do this, to change how we think about work, to push back a little bit on the idea that the captain has to decide everything, and instead turn the captain into a gardener, where we're nurturing a system, where we're nurturing an ecology, where performance is the outcome, not the demand. And last but not least, Hire, which is a Chinese appliance manufacturer uh, that is really rethinking structure. So, uh, you know, this is a, a company that's gone through many different sort of revolutions and, and renaissance over the last few years, and most recently, their CEO decided we are so far from the customer with our functions, our marketing and design and HR and sales and all these silos that we just completely lost touch. And so instead, what if we took our 60,000 people and we reorganized them into 2,000 autonomous teams with 10 to 20 people who have total P&L responsibility, who have one product, who have one customer, who are accountable kind of end-to-end -end for that experience? And that's what they did. And they created a completely different system where if you're a part of one of those teams, your job is to make it work or make it not work. And as soon as you decide whether you've got a winner or a loser, you continue to scale it or you shut it down and move on to the next one. So now your job safety is no longer tied to your role, right? You're part of hire. You can migrate between teams. You can spread your skills across a couple teams. But each team is accountable for actually performing. And each team has the right to make the decisions they need to make to make things work. It is now the fastest appliance uh, fastest growing appliance manufacturer in the world. They've gone from 60 to close to 120,000 employees in the same time frame that this change has taken place. And they even recently acquired GE Appliances, who was uh, struggling a little bit and, and went for sale. And for the first time in 10 years after adopting this model, they posted a, a revenue and a profit growth. So there's really something interesting going on there in terms of structure, and I highly recommend you take a look at it, not to mention the fact that it's coming out of a market that, you know, is so far away, and yet people always say, well, how does this work in China? How does this work in South America? How does this work in Antarctica? And the answer is, there's almost always a case of someone thinking differently and really bringing this stuff to bear. So those are four examples of over 68 that I touch on in the book. Um, there were many more, actually, when we started to do this research. There are hundreds in the corporate liberation movement in France alone, not to mention the, the hundreds that are uh, around the world, and some, as we mentioned, as big as 100,000, and some as small as five or 10 people figuring this stuff out. So what did we learn when we looked at all these organizations? Well, we learned that there's basically just two mindsets at the root of all this stuff. There's people positivity, and there's complexity consciousness. These are the two models at the heart of these changes. You don't have to memorize a 50-page list of mindsets and principles and practices. You just have to embody a couple simple ideas. 
The first is people positive, so meaning that people are capable of adapting, of growing, of, of building themselves, that they are deserving of trust and respect, that they're motivated by autonomy, mastery, and purpose, not bonuses, right? That, they're effect that we're not in a Skinner box, we're not behavioral and determinist, we're actually capable of putting ourselves in environments where we take responsibility and where we grow, but the aquarium matters, we're chameleons. So if you put us in an environment that tells us what matters is short-term results and individual performance and secrecy and politicking, in 20 years you'll be like, oh, Phil can't be trusted. He's only out for Phil and he does this and he does that. That's not the nature of Phil. That's Phil's behavior in this aquarium, right? It's not the fish. It's the aquarium, so people positive. And then complexity conscious, which we all now have an MBA in. So the idea that essentially there are different contexts and we need to show up with the right toolkit. We need to show up with the right constraints. We need to know our context and we need to allow things to emerge, right, through interaction. Those two mindsets are sufficient to guide us towards better practice. So as we look at the problems we're facing, the tensions we're facing, we can follow those threads. So at this point in the talk, when I give it to you know, leaders and teams, they're like, yeah, yeah, great, sounds good. Look, w let's change. But here's the thing, Aaron, change is impossible, right? Like we can't really change. We can't change at our scale. We can't change because of the regulators. We can't change because of our market. We can't change because our people are the wrong people. I've heard it all. And the reality is that our vision of change is kind of broken, right? This is the model of change that we all have in our heads. It's effectively the mourning process. Right? It is a death. We're basically saying change is death. And so it starts with resistance and some foreign element and then there's chaos and we get to the bottom of the barrel and we're so bummed and then eventually if we're lucky we transform and we get it and we crawl out and then we're 5% better off than we were when we started, right? Which doesn't seem like a very good deal to me. Um, and of course if you have a lot of money, if you're a big company, if you can afford a very good consulting company, then your change process looks like this. And so it's the exact same thing, but in three dimensions with more bullet points, right? That's what you're paying for. So, and again, look at this process and use your complexity consciousness to think about what might be wrong with this. So I'm gonna take 100,000 people through these stages in a linear way. How do you do that? There's no such thing as one culture. There's no such thing as one reality. We're not all in the discover phase. We're not all seeing the burning platform. We're not all enabled. We're, there's all this vibrancy and variance and richness in the culture that's happening. And the idea that somehow we're gonna shuttle it through this process or that we're gonna build a bridge that some people can take that others for some reason chose not to take. Um, those are the laggards among us. Uh, right? That's just nonsense, right? It's not actually how it's gonna happen. It's gonna be a lot more emergent than that. And so we have to buck this. So the idea is change how we change. We can actually have success if the change is done right. Change that's rejected is change not done well. If I offered to buy everyone in the room a Bentley, that's change, but y'all would be down with that. You'd be into that. But you wouldn't be into something that changed the way your job works or changed the power that you hold or changed the, you know, something that introduced something that you didn't participate in creating, right? So it's, it's change done badly that's the problem. And so I just wanted to share a few of the learned lessons, the little heuristics or principles that we've picked up, frankly, in failing to succeed in creating change over the last five to seven years. And once we've learned these things, they've really changed the amount of success that we've been able to have. So this is the basic process of change that we run now. It starts with tension. It starts with asking the question, what's stopping you from doing the best work of your life? Every team I've ever met with anywhere in the world has an answer to that question. We have meetings to prepare for meetings. Nobody trusts each other. We have too much email. We, have, we don't have the information that we need. We don't know how to make decisions. We have politics games that we play. We do the theater of reviews. We, my boss won't let me talk. He talks through the whole meeting. Everybody has an answer. And we go from there and we say, great, let's, let's say we all agree on attention. We have a, an issue that we're upset about. We don't trust each other. What are the practices that are alternative to that that could move us one step forward? So instead of imagining some future state that's far off for the company, let's think about the adjacent possible. What could we do that is one step away that would move us forward on that issue? So maybe what we'll do is maybe we're having trouble uh, you know, hearing each other, we're not getting all the input that we need, so maybe what we'll do is we'll start our meetings off with a check-in round where we hear from everyone to practice using all of our voices in a round. Sounds very simple, almost banal, 
but we know from the data now from social science that equal talk time is one of the biggest predictors of team success. So if I put a microphone in each of your meetings and I heard roughly equal talk time, I could bet on your success as a team. And if instead I heard one loud mouth for an hour, I could bet against it. And I would be more right than almost any other indicator that we can come up with right now. So we'll start with a check-in round, right? We'll do that at the beginning of meetings to use our voices. Okay, cool, let's design an experiment around that practice. How long could we try it before we would know if it was helping? Let's try it for four weeks, okay, and who will try it? This team and this team are willing to try. Okay, great, so we have two teams, they're gonna do check-ins at every meeting for four weeks, and how will we know if it works? Well, we'll just have a quick retrospective at the end. We'll talk to each other and decide if we feel like we're more heard, we're more connected, that there's more equal talk time, or maybe if we're really nerdy, we'll do some kind of a natural language processing, we'll actually measure the damn thing, right? But in any case, we'll know when we're done. Great, now we've done an experiment. And the goal is not for any one experiment to unlock this perfect platonic ideal of new ways of working. The goal is to teach every team at every level how to loop. Because if you can loop, you can learn. And if you can learn, you can find your way out of this mess to a way of working that serves you better as a system. So that is the big idea with the change. Now, while we're doing that looping, we have some of these you know, mindsets, principles, heuristics that help us be more successful. The first one is through them, not to them. So most of us think change happens when a new hero leader takes over and fixes everything for us and saves us. And isn't that lovely? They fix everything, the new PowerPoint comes out and it's ah, and everything's great. That is not reality. This is reality. This is what change actually looks like. It is happening in the team. It is happening through the team. Every team in the organization has to take ownership of their way of working, both locally and collectively globally, to have a truly resilient and adaptive system. So that is the first rule, is we don't do things to other people without their consent. We look for agreement. And by the way, consent is not consensus. There are lots of things that happen in my company that I give consent to that I don't agree with. Consent means safe to try. Somebody says, Aaron, I think we should do these meetings standing on one leg, and I have a really good reason for it. Is that safe to try for a week? Yeah, let's try it. There's a humility in saying, I don't know. I don't know what will work better. I don't know what will serve us or move us forward. I do know that's safe to try. That's my job, is to keep us from doing something that's not safe to try. At W.L. Gore, they used to refer to this as the water line. The water line on a boat. You get a hole in the boat below the water line, boat sinks, everybody's dead. You get a hole above the water line, you get back to shore, you patch that hole. So we're always asking ourselves in these systems, is that above or below the water line? You know, you wanna risk $100? Above the water line, knock yourself out. At Ritz-Carlton Hotels, anybody can spend $200 to make a guest happy. Above the water line. Anybody cannot spend $2 million. Below the water line, right? So we always have to build our judgment about that because now we're trusting each other. So now we're in the roundabout, so we need to know where that water line is, we're always talking about it. So through them, not to them, giving people the trust to play and asking them to play safely. Learn by doing. This is my son, Huxley, on the right, learning to ride a bike. When I learned to ride a bike, we did it with training wheels, right? I had the training wheels on and I was riding, but I wasn't really riding. I wasn't experiencing what it is to ride a bike. I was sort of simulating being in a spin class. Like it wasn't, it wasn't real. That's real, it's a balance bike. By the time you put the pedals on, that's just a way to go faster. They've already mastered the art of doing. So when we deal with teams, and I get the pushback of, well, I'm not sure if that's the right way to structure this project or hold this meeting or make this decision or what have you, I just say, look, we can debate it all day, but it's weather, so we don't know. Instead, what if we just tried it once? What if we found a way to make it safe to try so that we all know more about what it feels like and what it is, and then if you hate it, don't do it. But don't debate, don't waste time agonizing over what the weather's gonna be tomorrow. Pack an umbrella, get out there, right? So we start by learn by doing. The next thing, and this is a really powerful one, especially for those of you that are in larger companies or companies that are scaling fast, is that we get taught that if it's not big, it doesn't matter, right? If you work in a billion dollar company and you have an idea that moves the needle and you wanna move the needle 1%, right? You need a $10 million idea. It's a huge idea for 1% movement. So then when we hear things like, well, let's have one team try this, or two teams try that, or we'll, uh, we'll test this software for a day, people go, not big enough. It's not gonna move the needle for us, and so we can't do that. But the reality is that that is how systems move. You can't move the whole organization 
it's too big. It'll create this intractability about it. And the conversation that's happening next door is precisely my point, right? You can't move a boulder that big. You have to figure out how to break it down and test and learn and figure out ways to adapt within the complexity of the system. So small moves, we want lots of pebbles in the pond. I want to get as many pebbles in the pond as possible and I want as much transparency as possible around that starting small so that we're all learning from what everyone else is trying. Oh, this team did this and it really served them and here's a thing you can borrow to try it yourself. And I'm watching for spread. People often talk about, you know, how do you know when the change is working? Here's how we know when it's working. When practices I didn't teach a team are spreading without me to other teams. That's all you're looking for. You're looking for natural spread. That's the sign that you've introduced something into the system that it wants, that it craves. Another start rule is start by stopping. So I'm sure a lot of us talk about start by starting, get started, get in there, but there's a, a, a parallel to that which is start by stopping. So this is an actual client calendar. They had an average of 45 hours a week of meetings. So no time for lunch, you know, everybody's eating at their desk, et cetera. And uh, what's funny is when you have that much going on, it's really hard to fix it. You know, you can't do surgery on that patient live, right? There's too many systems failing. There's too many interconnections. So we said, you know, instead of adding a new meeting or trying to make one of these meetings better, what if we just stopped meeting? What if we stopped meeting for two weeks and see what hurts? And that's exactly what we did. So two weeks of no meetings just to see like, oh, what do I miss? And the reality is we didn't miss 45 hours a week of meetings, not even a little bit. What we missed was about 12 hours a week of meetings and they were very specific and very bespoke. It was we need to do this and we need this meeting for coordination and we need this meeting for vision and strategy and we got real disciplined about what needed to fill the gap because now for the first time in a decade, we were listening to ourselves. We were reflecting through that negative space. We had time to think. And the reality is if you don't take the time to think, you can't really reinvent the way you work. Doing it in mid-flight with everything going on with all this pressure can be impossible. And so the task often for teams and for leaders is to take things off the table. If there's a policy that's killing us, if our travel policy or our vacation policy or our you know, sales quota policy is killing us, don't jump right to making it better. Don't jump right to the improvement. Maybe just get rid of it and see what happens, what fills the space, right? Allow that emergence because you'd be surprised the system might invent a better solution than you could ever come up with by just creating the space for that to happen. So start by stopping is a good rule of thumb to at least consider before you add more stuff because I know the whole Marie Kondo life-changing magic thing that's happening. You open a kitchen drawer and you can see we're very bad at getting rid of stuff, right? You open a garage, you can see we're very bad at getting rid of stuff and the same is true in our organizations. And then the last principle that I'll leave you with is join the resistance. So it's very common in our industry, in our world, when we're, when we're the early adopters, when we're the change agents, to look at the people that are standing and waiting and saying no or not showing up and say, they're the laggards. They're the late adopters, they don't get it. You know, they, they're gonna have to get on the bus or get off, right? There's all this way of sort of polarizing what they're doing. Instead of approaching that with a curiosity and saying, what can we learn from them? Because people don't do stuff that's not in their best interest very often. And so if they're doing something that's not moving the needle, we have to figure out why. And I'll often just go have a conversation and say, hey, I noticed that you're not playing or that you didn't raise a hand or that you didn't show up. And I'm just, I'm not here to convince you to do it next time. I think more power to you, but I'm just wondering why. What's going on with you or with us or with this, this situation that might help? And they'll say, oh, I really love what you guys are doing, but I'm 45 hours of meetings a week, so I can't come, right? It's not gonna make sense for me until I can make time. Or they'll say, I love this new strategy, but my incentive, my bonus says that I gotta hit X, and I got two kids in private school, so I'm not showing up. Or it would be interesting to me, but only if we did X, Y, or Z. And then I'll ask, could you help me design a way to change what we're doing that might work for people like you? Not for you, because I know you're busy and you're not gonna do it, but for someone like you. And then they'll help me, we'll whiteboard and we'll figure out a way to, and by the end of the meeting, they're in. They just have learning to teach. They have, they need that curiosity to help us figure out what's missing. And so just approaching it with that spirit of collaboration and understanding gets us a lot of mileage. And it doesn't mean that we have to engage every person that doesn't want to play because frankly, there's enough of us that do that we can get the ball rolling. But if you have an issue with someone that looks like a resistor, stop treating them that way. Start treating them as an information radiator, someone that can teach you something and you'll find that there's a, a lot more openness there. 
So I leave you with this, uh, and then maybe we can get into some questions. Um, in the you know, latter part of the 20th century, this is how the high jump was done. This is the straddle technique. There were a couple others. And for the gentlemen in the audience, you can see how precarious this was. Um, this is the way we did the high jump. It was the only way to do it. And there were some good reasons for that back then. For, as a matter of fact, the other side of the high jump was dirt for a very long time. And so that, you were jumping over. You had to kind of land on your foot on the other side. But then slowly technology changed, the rules changed a little bit, and suddenly there was a pad on the other side that hadn't been there before, the pad for safety. And along came this gentleman, Dick Fosbury, and he had a very unusual, unorthodox technique of jumping over the high jump. He went over backwards and head first. And in high school he did this, and his coaches said, uh, Dick, that's lovely, but that's not gonna work. And then in college he did this, and his coaches said, Dick, that's lovely, but that's not gonna work. And then eventually they said, all right, Dick, you can do it, that's fine, it's good for you. And then eventually his, his colleagues in college tried it too, but they could never really master it. So it was just Dick that was doing it that way. And he went to the 1968 World Olympics and he won the gold medal and set the Olympic world record for the high jump. And everybody was in awe and there was a lot of talk, you know, traditional innovation talk about how he did it differently and how innovative that was. And, everything. and I think that's a great part of the story, but everybody's heard that. What I'm interested in is the reaction of the other competitors. Because the other competitors looked at it and said, hey, great for Dick, won't ever work for us. That's for him. That's what's good for Dick and that's lovely, but we're gonna keep doing it our way because that doesn't make sense for us. And that is what I hear every day in halls everywhere all around the world is, hey, works great for the USS Santa Fe, won't work for us. Works for Google, won't work for us. Works in that industry, oh, I'm, I guess the regulators in Sweden must be super nice to Lloyd or to you know, Handelsbanken because uh, what works for them, but it won't work for us. Everybody has a reason why it's good for Dick, but it's not good for them. But these are the facts. Shortly after this, people did start to do it, and to this day, only one person has held the world record that didn't jump over this way. So there was a necessary innovation there, but it required some bravery. It required going over backwards and head first, and let me tell you, the first time you do something backwards and head first, it feels super awkward. It feels very uncomfortable. It's not normal, right? And so it requires that commitment, that bravery and that willingness to try and see what happens. The worst case scenario, you land on your back on the pad, you roll over, you start again. Very worst case scenario, you go back to doing it the original way. That is the metaphor for what's going on right now. And my hope is that by sharing this story, by sharing these messages, we can get just a few more people around the world going over backwards and head first, doing it like a roundabout instead of a lighted intersection, taking the first step to see if we can move things forward. Because if we can, it's gonna unlock our ability to solve all these problems that we face, from the climate, to our politics, to our corporations, to our nonprofits. If we can change how we organize, we can change how we show up in these environments and we can rise to the occasion. So, thank you. So I guess we'll take a couple questions. How do you help to reduce the duplication of effort in this polyarchy? Yeah, great question. So uh, certainly when you have systems like this, there can be more redundancy, right? Two teams might try to do the same thing or they might try to solve the same problem in different ways. So there's two answers to that. One is that a little bit of duplication is actually good for innovation. So when we look in biological systems, it's often because we try a lot of things in tandem that we find a solution that works. You know, your immune system creates 10 million different lymphocytes every day to try to fight off all the stuff that's coming at you. So a little bit of duplication might be okay if you can afford it. And again, that goes back to safe to try in the water line. So again, if you're, if you're my company, we can risk a little bit of duplication to try to have some, you know, some competition internally, some innovation. If we were you know, a company with a billion dollars in revenue, we could risk a little bit more. And so there's that. The other answer, though, is that to get rid of needless duplication, we need to have the right kind of information ecology. We need information symmetry, and that means transparency and the flow of information have to be a priority. So using the right systems to keep track of what work in progress exists, where it exists, in the future even using new tools and things like AI to support that. So as we start projects, we can say, I'm starting a project to look at this issue around this customer, et cetera, and the system could say, hey, there's a couple teams you might want to talk to in Sri Lanka. So there's, there's both a future promise of that, but right now, we do it by channeling work into the same channels, the same you know, 
uh, project spaces, and even having moments of collision monthly, quarterly, et cetera, where we're talking about what we're doing and trying to create visibility without being too obnoxious. So there's a little bit of a push and pull there, and where we miss it, and there's unnecessary duplication, it is the cost of that uh, you know, adaptivity and that resiliency. So uh, any other questions? Right there. As a junior person in quite a change-resistant organization, what advice would you give to try and shift the mindset of the leaders from being very change-resistant to more this kind of thinking? Yeah, for sure. So a, a couple things. One is um, you know, change-resistant just means that we don't yet understand why we would want to do something. So one of the things that I tend to do in systems or that I advise others to do is just start sharing more of the kind of material that will open up our mindsets a little bit. So things about complexity, things about change that we see at other companies in our industry, in other, in other markets, et cetera. Maybe creating a channel or an internal newsletter or something where we're just sharing things about the changing world of work that can start uh, the fire. The second thing is figuring out what you can do locally. So if you have a team, you can ask that team, hey, at the end of every project, are we all willing to do a short retrospective to ask ourselves what we noticed and what we learned and what we might change the next time we do a project like this? Are we willing to spend an hour? Are we willing to spend 90 minutes? So sometimes just inviting and taking a little bit of space for each other, we can make change. We can change the way we show up, the way we communicate. We can be more transparent. We can model that stuff. That helps. Um, and then also, I think, you know, the reality is that really uh, asking the question, right, what, what's stopping us from doing the best work of our lives is a powerful question for any audience at any level. I ask it up, I ask it down, I ask it sideways. I want to know what people think the answer to that question is. And whatever the answer is gives me a toehold. So if I'm in a town hall and I'm the CEO and I'm in the back, I'm going to ask, hey, uh, what do you think is stopping this organization from doing the best work of its life? mic drop, and then they're going to have to say, like, well, I think it's this or that or the other, and I'm going to say, great, I'm going to start there, then that'll be the part that I chip away at, because I know we're aligned on that, and it gives us some, some common ground. The reality is that leaders have to realize two things. One, they think their job is to ensure perfect execution, but their job is actually to ensure continually growing capability, and so we need to manage organizations a lot more like we manage gardens and raise children. We want skin knees, we want mistakes, we want certain amounts of safe to try failure because we want capacity growth. And so the goal now is to sort of shift that. And part of that is recognizing that we want to trade control. We don't want to lose control. I don't want someone to give up all their control and get nothing in return. I want them to trade one form of control for the other. I want them to trade the lighted intersection where they have compliance-based control for the roundabout, where they have the control of social pressure and transparency and mutual accountability. Right? It's a different kind of control, and you know, sneak preview, it's more controlling. Right? We get more adaptivity and more resiliency and more you know, kind of outcome safety than we do in the other system. So it's less likely to have catastrophic failure. Um, but that's a trade, and it's a, it's a nervous trade. So we have to kind of work our way up to that. So those are a few things that I would try. Um, I also have to say, just in full candor, if I'm a young person, if I'm a talented person, if I have the privilege of choosing where I work, and I feel like they're not there, get the hell out. Go somewhere where these values are held, because there's a lot of workplaces like that, and you deserve it. Uh, okay, what else? In the back. It's just an observation, not a criticism, but in no part of your fantastic presentation, I have to say, you have not referred to entrepreneurism or entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And the question is, is there a reason for that? Sure, sure. No, that's a great point. I guess the reason is that I feel like most of the things that we would characterize as an entrepreneurial mindset, I consider as innate and somewhat natural. Now, certainly we're not all the same amount of risk averse, right? We have different amounts of risk tolerance, we have different kinds of privilege and situations that might limit how we show up, but I do think that people crave challenge. I think they crave important and meaningful missions and purpose. I think they crave a chance to be responsible, to learn, to grow, to try things, um, to do the new. And so, in general, I think there's an entrepreneurial spirit in, in a lot of these systems, and in fact, there's a lot more people that feel like they are leading, that they are, you know, there are 2,000 teams at hire, so there are 2,000 people at a minimum who feel like they're an entrepreneur, who feel like they're kind of driving at the front of something, at the edge of something. And when you talk to organizations in this space and you interview them, you say, you know, you say the word like leader, like, oh, are you leaderless? They often say, no, we're leaderful. Like, we have a lot of leaders here, maybe too many. Like, we have so many people who are leaning in to try to shape what happens next and to shape the future. And so that we're reckoning with a different set of, of challenges as a result. So I think that's a great point, and I'm, I am all for uh, entrepreneurship. 
Yes, sir. Just project, right? Shakespearean. Effective use of objectives, objective setting processes in organizations and performance reviews, which, you know, yeah. a bit of an industry in their own right, aren't they? Yeah, so totally. What do you think? Management by objectives. Um, a few thoughts. So the first is that I think uh, monodirectional, infrequent performance reviews are a bad idea. So I don't want to see an annual review that comes from one perspective. I think that's extremely limiting. It limits the amount of feedback I have, my chance to steer, and it limits the perspective taking to one person who has bias and limited view, et cetera, et cetera. So if I'm getting feedback, I'd rather get it from multiple directions. I'd rather get it more frequently. I'd rather be continuously steering. Right? That's, how I, that's how I get better at something. So I think a, a high candor, high frequency feedback culture is what we want to uh, strive to. But on the objectives front, we have strategy. So we have, we have some way to answer that question in the OS about what our strategy is. And I think of strategy as essentially figuring out what are the levers in a space that are going to you know, make the difference between succeeding and failing, and given what we have, what choices and what trade-offs will we make? So what will we prioritize, right? So, this, you know, a strategy that maybe Amazon would, would identify with is market share over margin, right? We're going to prioritize market share, even at the expense of something as lovely as margin, in order to make sure that we're dominant in a category, and then maybe later we'll get around, we'll flip the script and it'll go the other way. And so that idea of, you know, there's a strategy there. Now, underneath that strategy, there are going to be lots of different objectives. And so what we tend to try to do is make sure that the purpose of the organization is clear, that the priorities and the strategies are clear, both at a global level and at a local level. And then the actual objectives, you know, maybe, maybe they're consistent, maybe they're not, maybe they're highly defined, maybe they're not. I've seen it done well all these different ways. The consistent theme is that if there are objectives, they're set by the team for the team in alignment with purpose or in alignment with strategy. So someone will say, you know, these are our objectives because we're aware of the purpose and we're aware of the market share of our margin strategy, and now we're going to triangulate to that. But if we decide halfway through that it's actually over there, we're allowed, we have the freedom to redirect, and it doesn't mean we don't get a bonus or something like that. It just means that we're always trying to, to move continuously in that direction. So, um, yeah, I've seen it done a lot of different ways, and I think they're all okay. It's more about what's fit to purpose and what's fit to the context of the industry. Interestingly, um, this, this guy, Gerard Endenberg, who was one of the founders of Sociocracy, which is one way to run a community or a company, used to talk about riding a bicycle. And he would say, you know, if I give you a bicycle and I lock the handlebars towards an objective like B, and I tell you to pedal, you will 100% fall down. And you should try it at home if you like, but with pads. Um, you know, if you, if you have a bicycle, you can't move the handlebars, you will fall down within two or three seconds. But if instead the handlebars are loose, what I can do is I can look at B and I can overshoot and then I realize, oh, I'm too far left for B, turn right between A and B and back towards this way. And what I'm doing is I'm consciously correcting. I'm oversteering every time. I'm oversteering a little bit and I keep correcting back to B. This is what we want every team in our organization doing. We, wanting, we want awareness and alignment on what the goal is, what the purpose is, what the ultimate outcome is and we want to be continuously steering. And if we uh, choose outcomes or objectives or goals that are too granular or too narrow or too unadaptive to what might happen, sometimes we steer right towards the wrong thing. And so you see that in, in systemic failures where people have kind of been pedaling towards their metric and their metric turns out not to matter. You know? So what we choose to measure matters a lot. Uh, yes? Thank you. I think you partially answered uh, my question anyway, which was, I can imagine one of the pushbacks you get sometimes about some of the transformation you're talking about is around global consistency. Mm -hmm. So how do you create global consistency, especially in an organization who is looking for a global um, consistency of customer experience? Yeah and still allow this to ebb and flow in the way that you're suggesting. Correct, yeah. So, yeah, so there's a couple sides to the consistency question. This is about, you know, can we have a consistent brand or a consistent experience, or does the hamburger taste the same in every country? Um, and the answer here is, is twofold. So the first thing is that if consistency matters, if it actually matters to customers, then we should all be able to agree on the, cons on the consent around that consistency. So, like, if we can all agree that the burger should taste the same in every country, then we should consent to that and we should agree to that and we should actually enliven that at the edge. What's interesting is maybe when we don't agree, 
maybe when we think that custom, like local customization matters more, then there's a debate to be had. So I think that the answer at, at one level for consistency is if it's sensical, we should get there and we should be able to get there pretty quickly actually. So we, you know, I want all my bolts to fit on all my screws in every country in the world. If that doesn't work, we, we go out of business. So there's an alignment that can be achieved there. And on the more subtle stuff, it's worth the debate to be like, maybe the burger should be customized. You know, maybe it shouldn't be this, this meat in this country, it should be this meat in that country. Um, and maybe we lose some of our economies of scale as a result. But then again, if we're measured on the same global metrics, if we've all agreed that we're you know, gonna measure profit and revenue and customer satisfaction, then there's a dynamic tension there and we'll have to kind of debate and decide that. And that, by the way, doesn't mean that that decision needs to be made by 10,000 people all at the same time, right? It might be made through election, it might be made through consent at a, at a board level or an executive level. You know, these, these systems that are supposedly flat are not flat, they're just flatter. Um, and, and we give our consent to certain people in our system based on the roles they hold to make good choices about things like that. I don't want to vote on every hamburger and whether it should be consistent. So, um, so that's, that's a part of it. The other side of it is that, um, you know, consistency in terms of things like the brand, et cetera, is often held in a handful of roles. And so those roles that we elect people to or that they choose or that, or that we consent to, to people filling um, can still direct that stuff. So if we have a small marketing team that has the decision right to do that stuff, they can, they can exercise that decision right and make sure that our brand shows up the right way in a lot of different places. So it is an, it's a new, it's the other side of the coin. It's the other issue that we now have to deal with. Instead of the bureaucracy, we have to deal with how do we have alignment and consistency and coordination. But ultimately, in an environment where we're using judgment, we have transparency, we have good metrics, I think it's the easier, it's the easier puzzle to solve because the market tells us when we fail. So if it's not working, we know right away it's not working. The other one's a little bit more intractable. So everything's a trade-off. Who, sir? To be the leaders at different styles. So what are the new styles for the leader? Or is it a facilitator? Or where does it go? <laughs> yeah. So uh, yeah, wh who is the leader now in this system? So I, I, there's there's a couple answers to this as well. The first is you know leadership as we know it now just becomes more emergent. So. Different people lead at different times at different moments and contexts. So I'm, I'm an expert at this, or I have some very clear vision about that, and so I'm gonna step forward, and then in other times I'll step back, and other people in my team will step forward, and they'll kind of show me the way. So there's a little bit more of a dance of leadership, uh, leaderships, as we say, that goes on. The second role of leader, though, and this is coming from more of like a founder or a CEO or a, or a you know, P&L head perspective, is you're now the holder of space. So if we're trying to create this ecosystem where people are learning and trying and failing and doing and debating and agreeing and consenting and there's transparency and there's room and we're, but we're also good stewards of what's safe to try, that requires a kind of a protected space around the purpose and around the mission and around each other that has to be like nurtured and has to be defended and has to be looked out for because things will come in to try to mess that up. When you get that chemistry just right, Forces will come in, outside markets will come in, investors will come in, other team members that we've hired in with maybe less carefully will come in and they will start to disrupt that. So for example, at Lloyd's, or at, uh, excuse me, at um, Handelsbanken, uh, just a couple years ago, a new CEO came in and slowly started to consolidate power again, like a traditional bank. And the board actually stepped in and was like, hey, not okay, the branches are freaking out, you're out of here after 24 months. And that was a big deal. That was them protecting the space because no one else could do it for them. So the leader's job is to make sure that we have, that the garden is vibrant, that it is healthy, that we're treating each other with trust and respect, that we have transparency, that we're enforcing our own rules, our own consent, our own agreements. Um, and that's a very different role. It's, it's a gardener role and it, and it requires a different attitude and, and it requires a different ego and an identity, right? I'm no longer important because I have all the answers. Now I'm important because I hold the space. And that feels different. It was, I mean, it was and is hard for me. Um, yeah, I saw one over there. I'm looking for some balance. <clears throat> Who's tried this failed and what were the common reasons why? Oh yeah, so many people try and fail and also uh, recede back to the mean. Um, a couple reasons. So one, is, uh, one good example of, of uh, what I would say is not an abject failure, but a lot of struggle is Zappos in the United States. So they tried to adopt 
uh, whole cloth holacracy, which is another form of a way of working. It's another distributed authority system like I've been talking about. And they tried to do it through a pretty top-down mandate. So Tony came out and said, we're doing this, read this book, and then on Monday, if you're in, you're in, and if you're out, we're gonna pay you to leave. And it was very, um, it was very uh, black or white. And, and it didn't really involve a ton of participation or, or discovery, and it didn't involve a ton of customization. And I think what they've learned and what we've learned as a system is that every culture has its own nuances and its own subtleties, and they need to customize and mold to and fit the practices and find their own language. And I, you know, I think of it more like a buffet, right? There's all these companies doing things differently, and it's a buffet to say like, I like how they make decisions, I like how they do compensation, we're gonna invent this for ourselves from scratch. We're building a way of working, we're building an operating system, as opposed to having one happen to us. And so that to me was like the through us, not to us kind of uh, rule being broken. And then the other one that I see go sideways a lot is that we get this right for a while, and then we start to bring in talent as we scale because it's actually working and so now we're gonna grow. But as we bring in that talent, they bring in their operating system. So we hire a new VP of sales and they work at XYZ traditional company because we need adults because we're growing so fast. And the adults come in and the adults are like, you know what would make this sales organization work a lot better? is if I consolidated it all under me and we made it a nice tight silo and I told everybody how to do sales. That would work a lot better. So that, that kind of, regression to the mean happens a lot, and so that's a source of failure. Um, and frankly, the other source of failure that we see a lot is just not making the time. I mean, in our actual client work, the number one problem is intellectual excitement, spiritual excitement, and then it's time to get started, and on Friday, it's like, all right, we need that one hour for our retrospective, and it's like, oh, look at the time. We have quarterly goals to hit, and we can't quite get around to it, and we'll just do it next week, and it's, you know, I think, I think of what we do as a lot like personal training. It's diet and exercise. People tell us they want six-pack abs. I'm like, cool, see you at the gym at 6 a.m., um, and if they don't show up, then I can't help them. So there is a lot of showing up that's required, and we see a lot of struggle there as well. All right, I think we did it. We've exhausted ourselves, we're marinating in it. Uh, I really appreciate the thoughtful questions. Thanks so much.